Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another webinar co-hosted by the ITU WHO Focus Group on AI for Health and Harvard Medical School's Department of Biomedical Informatics. My name is Matthias Greschel. I'm a physician and researcher working with the Focus Group on AI for Health, which is co-hosted by ITU and WHO. These webinars and also the focus group um, are hosted under the umbrella of AI for Good, which is the UN's leading initiative around how AI can help achieve the sustainable development goals. If you're interested in learning more about AI for Good or the focus group I just mentioned, please reach out um, or click on the links in the chat later. We're always looking for um, people to join the effort. In this series, we're trying to cover um, many different aspects and relevant areas of AI for health research. And we've heard a lot about bias in the past talks, um, about models used to predict COVID um, hospitalization, which many of them weren't good. And um, yeah, today we have another session talking about um, bias and how it affects training models and their usefulness in clinical medicine. So I have the privilege of uh, introducing Enzo Ferrante, who's going to talk about fairness of machine learning classifiers in medical image analyses. So and today, Enzo will talk about the relationship between bias, machine learning, um, and will address uh, the specific case of gender bias in X-ray classifiers. So Dr. Ferrante um, received a systems engineering degree from Unison University in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He went on and moved across the ocean to graduate with a PhD in computer science from the Université Paris-Saclay, and then did a postdoc at Imperial College London. Um, Enzo returned to Argentina in 2017, where he now holds a permanent position at the Argentina's National Research Council. Enzo is leading the machine learning for biomedical image computing research line in the Research Institute for Signals, Systems, and Computational Intelligence since 2020. So these are a lot of words, but I don't want to forget to mention that Enzo also received two um, prestigious awards um, in 2020, the Young Researcher Award from the National Academy of Sciences of Argentina, and the Mercosur Science and Technology Award um, for his research and contributions in the field of AI for medical image computing. All right, enough for introductions. Um, to the audience, please ask away during um, Enzo's talk. You can ask questions as short as possible. That'll make it easier for us um, in the um, Q&A tab below. And um, yeah, for those listening on Twitter or YouTube, please join the webinar here so you can interact with us. And with no further ado, uh, please take it away. And so the floor is yours. Hi, Matias. Hello to the audience. And thank you very much uh, for the invitation. For me, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I've been following some of the previous talks uh, and, and seminars online, and, and I think this is a great venue. Uh, and what you are doing is, is amazing. So I'm really happy to be here today. Um, are you seeing my, my screen now? Or not yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, should I share it? I think if I share there. No, looking good. Yeah. We can see Perfect. your slides. Okay. Great. So um, I will just uh, put the timer because I'm <laughs> I'm not good with keeping time. Uh, so I will just yeah. There we are. <laughs> So today uh, we will be talking about fairness of machine learning classifiers for medical image analysis. Um, as Matthias was saying, um, medical image analysis and basically creating machine learning models for analyzing medical images is my main topic of research. So in this, in this talk, we will see one of the works we have presented uh, last year where we discuss a little bit the relation between bias and, and medical image computing. Um, the work I'll be presenting here uh, has been made in collaborations with many of my um, collaborators and students uh, from Argentina. This is the group of people with whom I work. And the things I'll be talking today are mostly done with uh, Diego Milone, Agostino Lorazabal, Nicolas Nieto, Victoria Peterson. And also I will mention some of the work we are doing now with Rodrigo and Agostina. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Argentinian geography, there is where we are. Uh, we are uh, the Research Institute uh, uh, for um, Signal Systems and Computational Intelligence. Um, we are located in Santa Fe City, uh, and we are part of the Argentina's National Research Council and Universidad Nacional del Litoral. 
it's a pretty green city. So if you come uh, here at some point, you will see something like that, the university and also the, the parks. Uh, can you see the mouse pointer? Yes, positive. I can see. Okay, right. Because I'll be using it. <laughs> okay, so this is who we are, but um, before talking about the, the, the paper itself or, or the work we have done, I wanted to let you know uh, a little bit how did we end up working on this on this on this topic. Um, a few years ago, we came across this this really interesting article by Jem Su and Londa Schivinger that I'm sure many of the people who are listening to this talk have seen before. Um, this is a really interesting article where, where James and Londa were basically um, discussing or, or putting in the table um, some of the consequences that AI systems may be having. Uh, when, I, when I read the title of this, of this article, AI can be sexist and racist, it's time to make it fair. And I, and I realized that I was creating these systems then I started to think, okay, what can be the consequences of this sexist and racist behavior of AI systems in the context of application where I am working? Um, and then I started to, to, to look at the examples they were proposing. This is a screenshot I took from my phone uh, back in 2018 or 19, I think, where I translated uh, two sentences um, from Spanish to English, for those who understand Spanish here, it says, ella es una investigadora, también escribe libros, which means she is a researcher, she also writes books, right? But here, somehow, it's putting he in the, in the, um, in the translation. And why? Well, because we now know that Google Translate was somehow perpetuating uh, gender stereotypes when doing these translations, and uh, basically changing the gender when coming from gender neutral expressions to um, to, to non-gender neutral expressions uh, in translating from Spanish to English. Um, and this kind of blow my mind. <laughs> it's like, what is going on here? If this is happening in translation systems, what can be happening in AI systems for diagnosis and these kind of things? Um, I, we also came across different things like uh, how bias basically is being expressed uh, in different AI systems. Um, here we are seeing a, a foundational work, I would say, by um, Joy Bulamwini and Timnit Gebru, published back in 2018, where they analyzed how face recognition systems we're also presenting racial bias in this case, not gender bias like in, case, in the previous one, but racial in this case. And they analyzed some of the commercial software um, that was used to perform face recognition. And they found that if you look at the different groups, different uh, intersections in this case between gender and race. So here we have dark female DF, dark male, like female and like male, um, well, what you can see is that when we look at the error rate for these classifiers, we were seeing a much higher error rate for all of them uh, in the group of dark female people than in the rest of the groups. So you can see that the numbers were really, really, really um, much higher in this case. And why these kind of things are happening? Well, one of the reasons we know is um, because of the data we use for this, for to train these models, right? So this is a sentence I I I, I like uh, from from uh, James and Londa paper where they say biases in the data often reflect deep and hidden imbalances in institutional infrastructures and social power relationships, uh, relations. Sorry. Um, and this is so true for many of the cases we had seen before in case of racial and in this case, most likely the training data the people used to train these models was mostly, uh, mostly um, uh, white people and mostly maybe male white people uh, because of the numbers that we are seeing here and the representation of dark female people was not uh, enough to train a model that is good at predicting, at performing face recognition on these, on these groups. 
And then th there are many, um, many articles that we kept on reading uh, from Londa, from this field, from, from these people from Stanford. Um, this is a really good uh, article published in Nature in 2019, where they somehow uh, survey the different uh, ways in which sex and gender analysis can improve science and engineering in general, and AI in particular. So if you're interested in these topics, I really recommend this. this this article. So these were the kind of articles we were reading about fairness and bias in AI in different application domains. And uh, so basically uh, this field uh, is called gender innovations. When you look at uh, how to incorporate sex and gender analysis into the um, into, into science and engineering. And then we were doing ourselves uh, medical um, medical image computing our, uh, software, right? This is what we were doing as, as, as a group. And so that's when we came out with this idea of exploring gender imbalance in medical imaging data sets and the impact that it has on classifiers for computed aided diagnosis. And this is what we will be talking today. Uh, the article was published in PNAS last year, and also it was um, discussed in different media articles like Stat News Agency and, and different other venues also in Spanish uh, here in Argentina and, and in Spain. And so the, the question we try to answer in this article is, is, is the following. What is the impact of gender unbalanced data set in deep learning models for image classification, for medical image classification? So the setting that we had is the following. We have images, in this case, X-ray images, big databases with a lot of X-ray images. And we will be training our convolutional neural networks that are basically representation learning uh, models that can transform, uh, that can learn useful features uh, from images to perform a classification task. In this case, the classification task that we are trying to do is pathology classification, is we are trying to tell whether there is a given pathology on this image or not like cardiomegaly, edema, fibrosis, different type of things, pneumonia. And we will get a score for every one of these, um, of these pathologies telling us the probability of this pathology being there or not. This is the model that we will be using in, in, this, in the experiments I'll be commenting here. And um, in general, in the literature of machine learning, when we uh, talk about unbalanced data sets, um, we refer to the target class in the sense that if we are talking um, about unbalance, like say, I don't know, I have 80% of one class and 20% of a different class of the other class. Um, in general, we are talking about target classes here. So the classes that we are predicting, but this is not the kind of unbalance we will be interested in this study. Here we will be looking at unbalance in terms of what we are calling protected attributes. So these are some demographic features, attributes of the population that we are analyzing that we actually don't want our model to look at. This can be, for example, sex, gender, age, ethnicity. And what we want to analyze is the impact of unbalanced data sets, considering unbalanced in this, in this sense, in the sense of uh, protected attributes, not in sense of the target class as we usually do in machine learning. And um, so to start motivating a little bit, why, um, why did we start asking about that? There is this really interesting work by uh, Veronica Cepligina and, and her students uh, that was published one or two years ago, I think, um, about uh, the risk of training diagnostic algorithms on data with demographic bias. They did a really interesting literature analysis of, of some papers uh, published at MICAI. MICAI is the main conference on medical image computing um, worldwide. So it's a really a big venue where a lot of researchers working on medical imaging and machine learning um, go together there and, and, and discuss these kind of things. And uh, what Veronica and her students analyzed was the proceedings of MICAI. Um, and, and they took the papers dealing with diagnosis using macroscopic images like X-ray, for example. 
And uh, from, the, from the proceedings of 2018, they just considered one year, they found 65 papers that were working on this topic. And from those, only 12 papers were describing age or sex of the population. Um, and 10 of those uh, papers were, were neuroimaging papers, particularly for that community. But of these 12 papers, only three were also evaluating or discussing the results with respect to the demographics. Why I'm putting this, this slide here? This is to show that basically, uh, first of all, reporting the um, age, sex, demographics, uh, attributes of your data set is not a common practice in our community. And discussing the results of your classifiers with respect to that is even worse. I mean, there, there, there's almost no words discussing these kind of things. And so this is not happening in our community. And now we will see what can be the consequences of uh, having classifiers and, and not discussing this kind of thing. So this is like a motivation slide that I wanted to put here so that you know that this is the situation right now that we have to improve. Um, so, so we had, the, so coming back to our paper in now, um, the, the, this is the experimental setting that we, that we put there. We had um, two big data sets. Um, maybe people here will know them. These are two really big data set of X-ray images where we have 100,000 uh, images in the first case and 200,000 images in the second case. Um, and the interesting thing about these data sets is that they're, they have a good balance, I would say, uh, in terms of gender here, um, with almost half half of the population, which will allow us to create counterfactual scenarios to simulate different type of imbalances in the data set and to analyze in a control scenario how this imbalance impacts the classifiers. This is the kind of study we will be doing here, and these are the data sets we are using. Um, so uh, the, the NIH dataset was published by NIH and the Chexpert dataset was, was published by University of, of Stanford. Um, well, these are some details here that we basically use only some frontal view images and the labels that were considered uncertain. And this, this data set have a particular, has a particular type of labels uh, which are related to uncertainty basically, and we consider them as negative labels. But these are, I would say, some implementation details. So we have two big databases here with annotations for all the images. So for every image, you have around uh, 14 different labels telling whether one of these diseases that we were saying before, pneumonia, cardiomegaly, the different diseases uh, are there or not. Um, and so the, the task that we will be training these models to do is basically to predict whether there is a given pathology or not. And for that, we will be using different uh, convolutional neural network architectures uh, because we want to see if the conclusions uh, that we will be extracting from our experiments are agnostic to the model architecture. So we will use three different um, architectures that are uh, well known <coughs> in the community, uh, like the DenseNet, ResNet, and Inception V3. Uh, these are deep, very deep convolutional neural networks. Um, that can be trained with this data and are used uh, for different classification tasks on, in the context of images. Um, and these are the two main scenarios that we analyze in the paper. We say the following. We say, okay, let's take our data set and let's partition it, uh, like divide it in male and female. And so we will train a model using only male images, 100% male images, and a different model using 100% female images. And then we will test on male and female patients separately to say what happens. And then we will also analyze partial cases. Like we will train, we, we will train with 25% uh, of female images and 75% of male images, 50-50, and uh, the inverse of, of the first one. Uh, and then we will test again on male and female and see what happens. Um, so, in methodological terms, we repeated this experiment 20 times with different training and test folds, considering the splits that I was telling you, uh, to observe the trends and basically filter noise that could be there coming from the training procedure. 
Uh, we contract, constructed these folds so that for every pathology, we have the same number of male and female patients so that we know that if there is a bias, that bias should be coming uh, from, from gender and not from different number of, of um, pathological cases in our data sets. And we measured the area under the ROC curve, uh, which is a standard uh, metric that is used in these scenarios for every model using different test sets. And so this is the first scenario that we consider. We train a model using male images and predicted on, on, on what we call the direct prediction on male patients and also on female, and we did the opposite. Uh, and this was done doing hundreds, hundred thousand images basically. Um, and here is one of the first things we started to observe. So this is, for example, the case for pneumothorax, one of the pathologies we were classifying. Here we are seeing uh, what's going on when testing on female-only patients for a model that was trained with male-only patients and we um, with um, female-only patients. And you can see here the AUC, that basically the higher, the better. Uh, and you can see that there is a difference in performance, right? So. Uh, when training with uh, female and testing on female, the trend in this case shows that this is higher. And we observed was, this was the case for a single pathology, but then we analyzed all the pathologies that we had in our data set. And we observed the same trend in this case. So testing on female patients again here for all the different pathologies, you can see that always the orange box is higher than the blue box in many cases with uh, significant and um, pretty significant differences. In some other cases, not so the differences are not significant, but in general, the trend that you can see is that you get a better performance if you train with female only patients when testing on female only um, tested. And of course, we did the opposite experiment and we observed what would happen when training with male patients and same thing was happening, but in the opposite direction. So here, blue boxes are much higher for many of these uh, pathologies than in case of female patients. And, um, sorry, I'm going to take some water. And we, and we did the same experiment because we wanted to see if this was uh, just by chance, I mean, this was already 20 repetitions every one of these boxes, right? But still, um, we observed uh, for different uh, network architectures, in this case, for example, is for DenseNet and for the NIH data set. But then we also changed the data set and the same trends were being observed. And we changed the architecture and the same things were being observed. So we did it for three different architectures, for two different data sets, all the combination, all the details are there in the paper in case you want to, to, to see that in more detail. And also the source code is available online. And so one may wonder why is this happening? I mean, when we are training with male and, and, and female patients, if we are looking for a pneumothorax or for a nodal in the line, the, 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 um, the gender should not be an issue for this, right? I mean, a nodule is there in the, in the lang. We can see the, the nodule. Why, when we change the distribution, these kind of things may happen. And this is something that, that is not there in the paper. This is an experiment we did afterward. And here we are showing, uh, these are called uh, class activation maps. This is basically showing you in uh, yellow which is the area of the image that the network is looking at to predict wherever it is predicting. And these are the results for, um, for a model trained with only male images and tested on female patients on the lang opacity task. So basically this is looking for lang opacities, uh, which is a radiological finding also of interest that is there in, in our database. Uh, and these, these are um, cases for full positive predictions. And what we are basically seeing here is that the network that was trained only with male images when tested on female images is mixing uh, breast with lang opacity. So this, this give us, gives us a cue about uh, what's going on here 
uh, basically when, when shifting the distribution of data, we are changing anatomy and some of the features that the model learned to perform this task that during training, the model didn't see male, um, sorry, breasts. And when, when we show uh, anatomy with breasts to the model, then the, the, the features it learned are not useful anymore. This is, is a domain shift problem. This is a problem well known in the, in the machine learning community. Um, when we change the data distribution somehow, and the models we have are not useful anymore. But it was not obvious that this may happen with medical images, but here in the paper, we show that this may happen. Um, and, and it's interesting if we go back many, many, many years in history and we look at this paper um, from 1958, where, where, where it was discussing basically how uh, people, how radiologists are analyzing uh, these kind of images. And, and they were also saying that the female breast is a common source of confusion in the interpretation of chest radiographs for people. So it makes sense that this also may be a, a source of confusion in this case. But, but this may also happen with other, uh, in this case, we, 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 we compare male and female images, but um, it may also happen with different attributes like age, ethnicity, uh, there are works now showing that, that we can infer ethnicity from an X-ray image. So, so, so we can look at, an, I mean, we can train a model to look at an X-ray image and infer ethnicity from there. So if we can do that, that means that there are some features in the image that are correlated with that. And deep learning models are really good at picking correlations and not always the right correlation, sometimes the wrong correlations. And so if this is picking uh, wrong correlations, then uh, it may happen that the model is trained with people from a given ethnicity and then test with a different ethnicity. The same thing that is we are seeing here with, with gender may also happen there. Um, well, other, other groups have also observed the same. This is a really interesting article by Melanie Gans, Shun Ho Holm, Holm, sorry, and Asa Fair again, which is also discussing our paper in particular, but also different cases. It's a really interesting article uh, to look at. And they are basically observing the, the same things. This, this is one of the explanations behind this phenomenon. Um, so this was the first uh, experiment we did, but we also did a different experiment, as I was telling you, where we consider a gradient of imbalances. So we say, okay, let's train a model with 75% male images and 25% female and test again, 50-50 and the inverse of the first one. And um, these were the results we were getting when looking at um, full imbalance scenarios, zero, 100%. And this is what you start seeing when you look at intermediate scenarios. And, and this is something interesting. Here we are testing on male only patients and we are looking at a, a model that was trained with 0% female, it means 100% male images or uh, the different uh, degrees of unbalance, right? And we can see that of course, for when training with 100% images, we get here the kind of the highest accuracy. But then when we start reducing and including also images from male, until we get to 50-50, there is no decrease in performance. There are no significant differences here. When we start to decrease more and more this percentage, then yes, of course, we end up with a difference. But this is something interesting, this conclusion here. It's telling us, if I diversify a little bit my data set, I'm not hurting, in this case, the male uh, population by adding uh, kind of 50-50 male and female. And this is something really interesting that we observed, not only for one, um, in this case, for atelectasis and pneumothorax, but this was kind of a, a general uh, trend as well. Okay, so this is the case of direct prediction, and this is the case of cross prediction. And in between, we can see this, this phenomenon. Um, say happened with pneumothorax, and say happened in the opposite direction, direction of course. Here we are testing on, on, on female images, and this is 0% female and 100% female. And again, the same thing uh, we, are, we are observing here. Cross prediction and for direct prediction. And then 
And when I remember one of the first times we did this uh, presentation about this work, then somebody say, okay, but then should we train a classifier per gender? That was one of the questions that appeared there. And uh, so in order to try to answer this question, we say, okay, um, let's think about the following scenario. Let's say we have 100 images of male and 100 images of female. The, the options we have is to basically train a classifier for male and female independently, or basically join these 200 images and create a merged data set and train a model with the 200 images, right? Not like in the previous case that we were having like a constant number of uh, images. It was always 100 and we were doing 50, 50 or whatever. Here we are saying, okay, we have 100 images of male, 100 images of female, and we evaluate the performance of independent classifiers or mixing all of them and also increasing the number of samples in our database. And what we observe is that in this case, the general trend is that is that it's better to use all the images instead of using only the male images in this case. So again, diversifying our data set is helping in this case to improve the overall performance. And why is that? Well, deep learning models need to see a variety of uh, images, a variety of, um, of samples to learn features that can generalize well to unseen images. And when we are increasing the diversity in our data set, we are basically showing our model uh, more, more um, different images and we, which can help to learn features that we generalize better. And this is something we know in the deep learning community, but here we are also um, supporting this with, with these experiments. And same happening in the, old, in the other direction, okay? So in this case, uh, we observed that it would be better to have a single classifier mixing all the images we had. So some takeaways from our work. Um, first of all, we show that even though the medical image community is not auditing um, these models at the group level, considering demographic attributes like sex, gender, or even age, ethnicity, this is something that we can do and we should be doing. Um, it was shown by, by the work of Veronica that, that the community is not doing that a lot, but we should be doing that. Um, why we should be doing that? Because basically it can be, uh, if we don't care about how we are constructing these databases, then the, our models could be biased towards um, a certain population showing better performance in one population than in another one. And so CNNs are prone to learn features that are useful for specific subgroups during training, uh, as we were seeing, and this may lead to a decrease in performance due to population shifts, like in these games, when we change anatomy. And uh, also, um, well, authors should report this demographic information together with the, MIC, with the medical image computing papers, and especially when also releasing public data sets. This is really important. We'll be coming back to this point now in a couple of, of slides. So diversifying your data set is really important, um, but it's not the only uh, thing we should be doing. Diversifying the data sets is basically not enough. Um, and, I, I, and now we will see some points uh, about why this, 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 this is like this, but basically um, I, I like this, this, this quote from, from Tim Nitgebru that says, a lot of times people are talking about bias in the sense of equalizing performance across groups, basically what we did in our paper. Uh, but they are not thinking about the underlying foundation, whether the task should exist in the first place, who creates it, who will deploy it, on which population, who owns the data and how it is used. So there are many more questions that we need to look at when dealing with bias in artificial intelligence and uh, which are beyond data. We can look at our models. We can think about models, uh, about basically the, the design decisions in our models that may lead or not to more biased or unbiased models. Uh, we also need to look at diversity in the teams of people who are uh, developing these, these systems, right? Because if you want to, um, if you want to create a model that is not 
acquire. I mean, it's really difficult to avoid uh, acquiring a bias in a model, right? And so the people that design these databases um, is taking decisions when, when deciding what to sample and what not to sample, for example. So even though we have the best intentions, uh, we may be incorporating biases even uh, by, by the sampling procedure we decide. And so if we have a diverse team, at least we will be incorporating a lot of different biases which will help uh, to diversify and, and, and to somehow uh, avoid, in this case, lower performance in certain subpopulations. Um, they, the interesting thing here is that the Mikai community, in, the, in general, the medical imaging community is starting to look at these problems. Um, so in 2020, there was a paper analyzing fairness of classifiers across different skin tones in dermatology uh, by people from IBM. Uh, last year in 2021, sorry, this year, uh, in the last Mika in 2021, we had this paper from King's College in London, um, which was really interesting. And I'm gonna give some more details about this because this is looking at fairness in cardiac magnetic resonance image analysis. And they were looking at a different problem, not image classification as we were seeing here, but image segmentation. Uh, image segmentation is basically assigning a class to every pixel. It's a different problem. It's a much more structured problem than image classification. Um, in this case, you want to segment the different structures of the heart in an MR image. And they basically took a big database also uh, with different ethnicities. And what they showed is that this model was again biased, in this case, um, presenting a better performance for a white population than for the rest of the population. And when you look at the composition of the data set used to train this model, when you can see that most of them were white, because this is how the data set was constructed, representing the population of a certain uh, area. I think these images were, I don't remember exactly from where they were coming, uh, the images on the paper. I think it was from the UK. Um, so the data set was well balanced in terms of gender, but not in terms of ethnicity. Uh, and, and, and they showed that basically, so it's not only image classification, but it's also image segmentation that may inherit these biases. Uh, and not only in terms of gender or, or age, but also in terms of ethnicity. This is a really interesting work that for people um, interested in these topics, I recommend uh, reading. <clears throat> and then a few, um, this is something really recent I came across, um, which are good practices for trustworthy AI in medical imaging. This is a work that is being developed by um, people from University of Barcelona. And they compiled uh, a list of like a checklist of recommendations, uh, not only for fairness, but also for universality, traceability, usability, robustness, and explainability uh, that are really, really interesting if you are thinking about creating a solution using AI in medical images. Uh, I think going through this checklist and kind of asking yourself the questions they are asking are really is something that is going to be a really useful exercise to improve the fairness uh, of, of, of your project. And here I um, took only the fairness chapter from these recommendations and I wanted to kind of close this talk going through the points they are, they are mentioning there, which are the recommendations they are giving. Um, and so they, they touch different points. Uh, one of them is, as I was telling before, interdisciplinarity, basically uh, taking into account diverse perspectives uh, brought by multidisciplinary teams or comprising not only AI developers, but also radiologists, specialists, people who know about the images, but also patients, social scientists, like trying to open the discussion uh, and going out of our comfort zone somehow. Also incorporated patients in, this, in these discussions and social scientists. Another point uh, that they touch is understanding bias with the help of domain experts. Because here we showed, for example, that our systems can be biased in terms of gender or maybe age or maybe um, 
it could be ethnicity. But there are other application specific sources of bias. For example, in this case, they are mentioning underrepresentation of high breast densities in a breast imaging data set that may not be obvious to us uh, that this underrepresentation of patients may be causing a bias towards that subpopulation. And that we need to analyze that with domain experts to discuss in every specific case, which are the potential sources of bias that may appear. Um, another point that also relates to what we were saying before is the importance of metadata labeling. So when releasing data sets, non-imaging metadata such as sex, age, ethnicity, and income sometimes, or, or, or other things, sh should also be included if possible. This point is important and has, has to always be weighted with the privacy issues that may emerge here, right? We don't want, we want our data to be anonymized as much as possible. We don't want to expose anybody. So when we start increasing the metadata associated with these um, labels, with, sorry, with these uh, images, we start somehow um, a discussion, a trade-off between data utility and privacy that has to be taken into account when constructing these data sets. Um, also, it's important to estimate data unbalance across diverse, diverse uh, patient groups in the data sets, right? The type of exercise we were doing before, but looking at the real database we are using now and seeing and analyzing, okay, how, what's the distribution in terms of gender, in terms of sex, in terms of age, et cetera, to identify potential sources of biases. Another recommendation that is really important in the context of, of medical imaging is to work with multi-centric data sets. So basically data sets that have been captured in different medical centers to account for difference in population, resources, geographies, and also in terms of uh, configuration parameters of the machine, brands of the machines used to capture uh, the images. There are different sources of um, potential shifts in our data set. It's not only the demographic of the population, but it's also the type of modality, of image modality we are using. Um, there are many factors that may produce a shift in data distribution that given our trained model with a specific data set, now we, we try to test in a different data set and it doesn't work anymore, or, it, or the performance is much uh, lower. So using multicentric data sets is a way to tackle this point. Well, of course, perform uh, algorithmic uh, fairness evaluation, yes, continuously, not only when training the model, but also if we deploy a model in a hospital to continue seeing whether the population that is coming is being, um, all of them are receiving kind of the same treatment by the algorithm uh, and using a specific uh, dedicated metrics um, based on uh, coming from the fairness literature. And of course, depending on the problem, we will use one metric or the other, like statistical parity, equalized Schultz, predictive equality, et cetera. Uh, also, when bias is detected, we can think about ways of correcting it and, 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 and improving the fairness of that model. And finally, something that is also really important, and I think AI for good is uh, helping a lot to that, is providing, um, creating awareness about this topic. So not only in the AI community, but also in the users, in the final users of this software, in the doctors, it's important to raise awareness, awareness sorry, and inform end users, radiologists, everybody about the potential um, biases that our algorithms may have so that they, uh, well, they know what, with what they are dealing. So this is to, con to conclude also just to briefly mention other research uh, lines in which we are working. Uh, this is joint work we are doing with Rodrigo Echeveste and Agustina Ricci, one of our PhD students who is working in the hospital, in the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires, um, basically analyzing um, fairness of skin lesion classifiers. Yes, uh, and this, is, this intersects with, with uh, ethnicity, uh, in Argentina, we have a, a, a big range. Uh, our population is really diverse, um, and, and we want to see whether the, the, um, the skin lesion classifiers that are created, let's say, in the US or in other countries are good for our population. So we are 
starting different type of analysis in that sense. And also a different line of research where I'm working as a consultant <coughs> is for the <coughs> Argentinian public health research on data science and artificial intelligence for epidemic prevention project. This is the ARF AI project that we call it. It's a, pro it's a project funded by the International Development Center from Canada, the IDRC, and the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, the CIDA. And we are basically laying the foundations to incorporate artificial intelligence uh, for the early detection of, of pandemic outbreaks, uh, epidemic outbreaks, using electronic health records in the project. So this project deals with electronic health records, not with images. But where I am trying to help with in this project is to basically consider a transversal responsible AI practices. So to incorporate all these guidelines that we were discussing before in all the dimensions of this project that is basically creating AI models to analyze electronic health records. And we are doing that at all the different levels. First of all, at the team composition, our team is diverse in the sense that uh, for example, we have more than half of the team uh, are women. Women are in um, really top positions, directing and coordinating the project. Uh, we are also involving members from the LGBT community as myself, but other ones as well. Um, we are um, also looking at responsible AI practices in the data collection and analysis processes. So we are looking at um, how we represent our patients in these databases, what can we learn from the data that has been collected in terms of biases in the health system. So it's a really uh, wide spectrum of tasks where we are trying to incorporate these, <clears throat> these ideas and also at the model level. So trying to audit, trying to audit our models um, to be sure that the for example, the model, the project has different models, for example, for phenotyping. So basically analyzing electronic health records and telling us what is in there, um, which type of pathologies, for example, are the, the doctors describing. And we want to audit these models in terms of fairness to be sure that the model is doing well across the whole population. Uh, with that, I'm closing. Uh, I'm sorry, I went a little bit... Uh, behind the time uh, and well, muchas gracias. You're perfect, perfectly in time. Thank you so much, And so That was really brilliant. And um, so many important or extremely important aspects of, yeah, of, of this, um, of, of, you know, the AI revolution or like the third heyday um, of AI as my department chair is usually saying it, like the whole thing of biases that we are now just becoming aware of and where a large community of researchers, including yourself, is really working on to make sure we understand them before it can hurt anyone. Um, so I wanna invite everyone again, please submit your questions in the Q&A tab. And I just wanna start off with something you mentioned already. Um, so if there's a company who's selling um, a tool um, to diagnose based on an X-ray, would you recommend them to train separate models for um, female and male sex? <laughs> Yeah, this is like, um, well, first of all, I want to do a kind of a disclaimer uh, with respect to sex gender term that we are using here, uh, because, yeah, this is this was a, a point that we discussed a lot while writing this paper. You will see that through all the whole uh, paper and also in the presentation, I was using the term gender because the NIH uh, data set that we used at, at the beginning um, had the gender label. The label was called gender, and we wanted to stick to that. Yeah. However, uh, here we are analyzing anatomical differences and these kind of things we were seeing that are the ones in the images producing this, the shift, the domain shift. So um, it, we, we also discussed that in the paper saying that we believe that biological sex should be the term that should have been used here instead of gender. We stick to gender because of, of the data set, uh, mm -hmm. how it was um, created, but, but in this case, so this is just a general disclaimer that I forgot to do in the in the presentation, but yeah, it's, it's something uh, important to take into account, use the correct terms. Um, but now coming back to your question on whether or not we should have different models for specific subgroups, this is one of the strategies that is proposed also in the literature as a way to mitigate bias somehow. So if you have access at test time for about this, um, about this uh, attribute, 
uh, well, you could train one model for one sex or the other in this case. But this opens a lot of questions that I don't want to ask to a patient before going into a, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't like to ask question, what's your gender before going into one or another system, right? Like think about uh, trans people, for example. So it's, it's really um, a door I don't want to open somehow. Yeah. So that's why we did this experiment. And, <clears throat> and we observed that basically, if you have a lot of data from different sex, just use all the data you have. Do not uh, create independent models that are trained with less data. We know that deep learning models are, are, are greedy. They like to have more and more data to learn uh, more useful representations. So we can exploit the data in a better way if we merge that. M maybe there are specific cases where you can think about having um, like a specific model for specific subgroups. But in general, I would avoid that uh, if right. possible. All right. Um, so Philip is asking um, if you've thought about adding biological sex as a covariate to the models, if that would... Um... Yeah, well, this is another strategy that you can somehow try to use. I think... Um, I think it has, in, in case of sex, gender, it has kind of the same uh, issue I was saying before about kind of having this attribute before doing the prediction. Uh, you can use that to try to debias your model to learn basically um, invariant features with respect to these attributes. If you have these attributes during training, then you can train your model to be invar or you can try to train your model or use uh, bias mitigation methods that are based on learning invariant features. Uh, so features that are the same for male and, and, and female. You, you, you ask your model to avoid using specific features that are um, correlated with sex. And this can be done by using adversarial training or this kind of training. So this would be one of the ways in you can try to incorporate sex, gender, age, ethnicity, or whatever into, into, the, into the model. Okay. So another question by Philip, um, he's asking about, um, so if you have biased AI, AI algorithms, um, and Philip is now talking about, asking about by ethnicity, mm -hmm. what's, um, where do you see the biggest um, problem? Um, yeah, if you, if you employ biased, like ethnicity bias algorithms in a healthcare setting? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the question is really interesting. Um, it's different when we are talking about a system for decision making or in the healthcare setting, right? I mean, it's, it's, these are like two different settings. So in healthcare, in some conditions, as I was saying, in some cases, we may think about models that are tailored for specific subpopulations. But before going there, we need to create awareness about the fact that these models can be racist. So why, what's wrong with racist say? Well, I don't know if there's something wrong with this in this particular case, but we need to create awareness and know that this can happen because people may not think that because I train a model using population, like a data set collected in the US, it may not perform in the same way in Argentina. This is not something obvious. Uh, so the first thing we are trying to do with these works is to create awareness about that. Then we can move toward, I think that there is an interesting study on that in the paper that I was telling you on segmentation, um, where they show the impact of ethnicity in that, in that kind. There is nothing wrong with tailoring a system for, to work well in a certain subpopulation, but we have to be aware that the model will work well there, but maybe if we move to a different, even a different part of the country, in the same country, or we just change the brand of the machine we are using to capture the images, this may not be uh, going well again. So that's why it's so important to keep on evaluating fairness, performance, to basically audit your model, not only at training, but also at deployment and when you are using the model. Yeah. Yeah, so Philip, please let us know if you wanna ask any follow-up questions. Um, that's definitely extremely relevant. Um, to be aware and to not be discriminatory without knowing um, it's that really should never happen in healthcare. And I think also if, if I put myself as a physician, I would never trust a model where I don't know exactly how, you know, how, how it works, how it's biased. Um, 
I would never yeah, totally. predictions in, in my daily routine in the hospital. Totally. <clears throat> so I'm also really interested in, um, so now you've, you've used um, biological sex um, as sort of the, you know, the, you stratified by it and, and showed divergent um, performance across these, these two, you know, these two parts of the data set. How about, um, and there's a lot of discussion about non-binary, um, you know, mm. representation of gender. What's your thinking about this and how would you, how would you go about improving? Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a really important question, I think, particularly in this case. Uh, there are, I mean, when we, look, when, when we talk about age, for example, there is no doubt about the number we should put in that field, right? I mean, our age is just the age and it's a value, an integral number, whatever. In case of gender, for example, it's a fluid concept. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural construction. Um, so how do we label our samples in that sense? This is a question for which I do not have an answer. There is, there is a really nice article uh, by um, uh, Mohamed, uh, it's from DeepMind, uh, I don't remember, Sha Shakir Mohamed mm -hmm. uh, and his team from DeepMind uh, that talks about this issue, not only with medical images, but in general, the impact particularly that these AI systems have on the queer community and, um, and they, they touch this thing and they discuss this idea of there are some attributes that are fundamentally unmeasurable. And how do we deal with that when training our machine learning models, which require labels somehow to... Uh, so I do not have an answer to your question. I just have more questions, I would say. And I think it's, uh, it's something that we have to be looking at right now, because otherwise, we may risk leaving apart a uh, certain uh, part of our population, right? That cannot be represented with the data schemes we have right now. And I'm really worried about the prospect of um, commercial AI products. Um, I've been recently involved in a sort of, you know, administering a survey to companies um, and to understand what level of transparency and trustworthiness um, there is. And in most cases, they're not able, you know, to disclose lots of details we as researchers would need to really understand what bias are in models. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you have any comment on this? Um... Well, I think there is like the regulatory agencies who have to come into a scene. Um, when you want to get approval from FDA from, from, for, for a particular, um, in case of the US, right? For a particular tool that is using AI for medical image analysis. I think we should at least have uh, the aggregated information of the, of, the, of the population that was used for that. For that. Um, there, are, there are some recommendations in the FDA that at least tell, uh, well, you should train your model with a population that is representative of the target population in which you're gonna use these things. But I think releasing this at least an aggregated level, because there is always a trade-off between privacy and um, utility of data, right? This is something I, I, I say before, and I, I kind of always stick to that. But, uh, but yeah, I agree. We need to have somehow uh, information of what data was used to, for training, um, because they may impact the model we have at the end. We have one last question from Jonathan. He's asking, how do you mitigate um, bias by by machine type, um, you know, in, in when predicting the machine, the X-ray machine, for example, instead of the outcome that you want to predict? Uh, sorry, when using data collected from different machines, what procedure do you suggest to avoid the model learning the machine type instead of the target feature? Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, um, there are different techniques you can use. One of them is adversarial training, uh, where you basically train the model the, the, the predictive model that you have. And you also incorporate some other classifier that can tell, I mean, you train, I don't know if you are familiar with adversarial models, but in, basic, in general, you have like two models, one that makes the predictions and another one that is called the discriminator that um, 
looks at some features from the from the other model and try to tell uh, between fake and real in one case if you are doing generative models. But in this case, you will ask the discriminator to tell from which um, machine the data is coming just by looking at the features that are flowing through the CNN, through the predictive model. And basically you will train the, the other model to, to uh, confound this other, right? To make it um, make, uh, yeah, like wrong predictions. And by doing that, you can learn invariant representations in terms of uh, machine. There are also, um, different techniques the, the, the problem here or the main concept you look you should look at is uh, unsupervised domain adaptation in this case uh, this is like what we are doing here when changing from one machine to another one is basically doing domain adaptation and if we can do it in an unsupervised way in a sense that we do not have labels uh, for for the new machines that are coming then it's better right because it's cheaper because we don't need annotations so the literature of domain adaptation, I think, is the is the is the is the point. Yeah, we should be looking. Okay, thank you, Ansel. Again, we're at the hour, and I'd like to close today's um, webinar. Um, we're really grateful for your time and for this really amazing talk. Um, really clear results, really clear implications, um, although challenging to really address at scale. Um, but it's a process, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to know that you and you know other researchers in the community are working on this um, so we'd like to now launch a quick poll to see if um, the attendees would recommend ai for good webinars for um, that helps us to evaluate um, you know and go back to our superiors and get feedback and i would like to um, also point to two webinars we have in january on some aspects that we just talked about with and so we'll have one um, around binary and non-binary you know, representation of gender, and we'll have another one around um, target that is really difficult to to um, you know to to address and predict with, around psychiatric disorders. So please check out the website. On December seventeenth, we'll have Nigam Shaw, um, moderated by Sakohani, um, talking here um, as um, on this AI for Good AI and Health webinar. So please join. Um, we'll make sure to send around the newsletters as usual. And yeah, with that, I'd like to thank again Enzo um, to Gino, who was helping in the back end making this work. And have a great rest of the week and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Goodbye. Bye.
Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. 